Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because we're a little bit short on time. What I'm gonna to try to do is get through the theory, start this script, and then send you home with some homework. Try to, to run some of this script yourself tonight, and then we can come back tomorrow morning and visit any problems you had and finish it up. So the, the role of genomic selection in the big scheme of markers and crop improvement is simply to provide predictions, okay? And typically, we're gonna be using it in a breeding program, uh, and we're gonna use the predictions for making selections, and we're gonna be making the predictions on elite germplasm that makes up our breeding program. So, in a little bit of terminology surrounding genomic selection, we have what we do, we combine the DNA marker data, our SNP data, or whatever type of marker it is, with our phenotypic data, and we call that the training population, or the estimation set, or the calibration set. It's known by lots of different names. We combine that together, we form a statistical model relating the genotypes and the phenotypes, and we use that statistical model to predict the genetic value of individuals that have been genotyped but not phenotyped. And then hopefully these predictions are pretty good so that we can use them for making selections and make genetic gain in our breeding program more rapidly. The difference between this approach and a traditional marker-assisted selection approach is we're not doing QTL mapping. We're not first identifying which genes we think or which markers we think are really important for our trait and using only those for making selections. We're simply combining all the DNA marker data together and building a single statistical model and making selections on that. There's no statistical testing going on here. And the reason we like this is because it typically, for complex traits, it typically works better than taking a traditional marker-assisted selection approach. Yeah, and that's demonstrated in these two figures here. I should say this figure on the left is a figure out of this paper by um, Bernardo's group in 2009 where they looked at about, I think, 36 different combinations of traits and populations and compared genomic prediction accuracy with marker-assisted selection prediction accuracy or traditional marker-assisted selection prediction accuracy and showed that prediction accuracy from the genomic prediction worked a lot better oftentimes, and at least as well, always, than marker-assisted selection. All right, so I want to back up a little bit here and give uh, a tad bit of history. So way back in 2000, uh, Whitaker et al., these authors, pointed out that there's really no satisfactory way of doing marker-assisted selection. There's no perfect subset of markers that, that works really well, or not, there's not an entirely satisfactory way to choose these, this subset of markers. And they wanted to use an approach that allowed them to estimate the effects of all the markers simultaneously. And the, the statistical approach that they took was call, is, is called ridge regression. Okay. And so what you're basically interested in is you're interested in a subset of markers. Uh, I guess this is the, the old-fashioned approach. I shouldn't say old-fashioned, the traditional marker system selection approach, where we're selecting out the subset of markers. Let's call it subset Q and we're estimating the effects of each of those markers, and we're summing all those up to get an estimate of our genetic value, which we're denoting here is, is uh, A hat. And we estimate those effects using our ordinary least squares estimates represented by this equation here, okay? These X's here contain, these are our incidence matrices for the markers, and Y is our, our phenotypes. So we can't include all the markers we can't estimate the effects of all the markers simultaneously, especially if the markers, the number of markers exceeds the number of individuals in our population, which is nearly always the case in today's environment of high throughput, uh, high density genotyping. So even if we did have enough individuals, if we had fewer markers than individuals, and we fit all the marker effects simultaneously, uh, we would have probably an overfit model, and it would increase the variance of our betas, which is bad. And like I said, oftentimes we don't have enough degrees of freedom in our population to estimate all those marker effects simultaneously. So this isn't going to work. So, we, so we're evaluating this approach called ridge regression, where basically we're adding this lambda i to our ordinary least squares estimates. And what this essentially does is it shrinks the marker effects down towards zero, but it allows us but it, 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 it reduces the variance on these marker effect estimates. Okay. And we want to choose a lambda here that minimizes the model error. And again, the addition of this lambda to this, this uh, cross product matrix here uh, reduces the collinearity. Okay. 
And I should point out that if you have a situation where the number of markers exceeds the number of individuals or the number of columns in this X matrix here uh, exceeds the number of rows, this X prime X matrix here is, is uh, not full rank, so you can't take the inverse of it, so you can't even do it. So that's why we need to take this different approach called ridge regression. And this prevents the X prime X matrix from becoming singular. And what the, these authors showed was that the ridge regression approach, uh, when you applied this to multiple cycles of selection within a simulation, it oftentimes worked better than the subsets, or it always worked better than the subselection, subset selection approach. All right, and then everybody, people who are familiar with genomic prediction uh, know this Mewison paper, 2001 paper. They, sh they took a, uh, they also, or they asked a similar question and they wanted to compare different statistical models for their accuracy in predicting total breeding value. And what they did was a computer simulation. Uh, they had 2,000 individuals, and they wanted to estimate 50,000 haplotype effects or marker effects. Okay? And again, they compared prediction accuracy here is on the y-axis, is the correlation between our genomic estimated breeding value and our true, our true breeding value. And if we calculate or our, if we calculate our genomic estimated breeding value with our ordinary least squares estimates, you can see that it's often, or it is uh, quite inferior to the genomic selection models, the models that include all the marker information in them. All right, so again, in a genomic selection approach, we oftentimes have this, what we call the large P, small N problem. We have more marker predictors to whose effects we want to estimate than we have observations, so we need to use these special models. Ordinary least squares estimates aren't going to work anymore. So we use things that uh, we call shrinkage models. We shrink the effects down towards zero. Uh, and we use things called variable selection models, which of often come in a Bayesian flavor, and machine learning models. We don't have time to go into each of these uh, in much detail. But I do want to point out that you know if we go back to our baseline model here, where our, uh, we model our phenotype here, with a summation of marker effects. The question is, how are these marker effects distributed? Okay? And if we have more predictors or more marker effects to estimate than we do variables, then our solution to this problem is we fit these marker effects as random. And what this essentially does is it, it constrains these marker effects to fit some distribution. Okay? And the question is, what distribution are these marker effects being sampled from? Or how are we constraining these marker effects? And there are lots of different um, flavors of these out there. Ridge regression assumes that these marker effects all come from a common normal distribution that has a variance uh, that, uh, that has a common variance that is estimated from the data. Uh, Lasso approach would assume that these marker effects come from a double exponential model that has that whose shape is dictated by this lambda lambda parameter, or we might take a Bayesian approach, a variable selection approach called Bayes C pi, uh, where we assume that where our marker effects come from uh, either they're set as zero or they come from a normal distribution, again, with a common variance, okay? And then the, the probability that each of these marker effects come from these two different distributions is set by this parameter pi, which in base C pi is actually estimated from the data. Um, let's see here. So these are just some pictures of the different distributions marker effects can come from. So you can see that uh, the normal distribution is one option, is, is, the, is what ridge regression assumes. And you know what a normal distribution looks like. The double exponential distribution here, I guess the thing I want to point out is that the double exponential distribution has heavier tails, okay? So more markers are gonna be constrained and pushed back towards zero, but some markers, since they have heavier tails here, are going to be allowed to have a larger effect, okay, than the normal distribution. That's all I want to point out with that. And there are different shapes of distributions out there. Okay, so if that was completely Greek to you, I guess the practical outcome is, is that, that uh, marker effects or markers are constrained uh, to different degrees towards some common value, oftentimes zero. So here, what we have is, is a simulation. And in the simulation, what I did was I simulated lots and lots of very, very, very small effects markers that are controlling the variation for a trait. 
And I also simulated one big large effect, UTL, uh, that's controlling a good proportion of the variation for this trait. Okay. So you can see that when you estimate the marker effects using an R bluff model, where the marker effects are all assumed to come from a common distribution, they're all constrained down towards zero to the same degree. Okay. You can see that they're all shrunk. If you look at the scales on these axes, you can see that all the marker effects uh, are fairly close to zero, estimated with the R bluff model. <clears throat> if you use a base C Bayes C pi model, on the other hand, which allows the marker effects to come from two, dis two different distributions, you can see that the marker effect is being allowed to express itself uh, more. And it actually, especially if you look at the axes on this, on the y here, the scale on the y axis, you can see that it's way out here at 10. Okay? And that, that's pretty close to what the actual QTL effect was simulated to be. So. Um, Again, it allows big effect QTL to express themselves more because it allows marker effects to come from two different distributions as opposed to just one common distribution. Again, you can see that with this figure here where base C pi allows larger effect markers to express themselves. Our blup pushes everything back towards zero. Okay. All right, and then there's G blup. Uh, if you've read much about genomic selection, you've surely run into G blup. This is a different approach uh, although it's equivalent to rigid regression when you make certain assumptions. But uh, basically, it's a similar tra to a traditional BLUP with pedigrees. Uh, we're going to calculate a genomic, but, but rather than use a, a pedigree relationship matrix to make our predictions, we're going to calculate the relationship matrix using our genome-wide markers. Okay, so, and then we're going to fit this genomic relationship matrix in a mixed model, okay, where we have this polygenic effect here, and we're going to assume this, that this polygenic effect follows this multivariate normal distribution that has this covariance matrix here that's equal to G, which is our genomic relationship matrix. And there are some weird things that popped up in my matrix here. I know these are not supposed to be M's and L's. These are all supposed to be G's. I don't know where those came from. It must be a Mac thing. <laughs> uh, so in this G matrix, basically you have the the realized genomic relationship matrix between all the pairs of individuals in your population. And that's used to model the covariances um, in your population. And essentially what you do is you take the relationships between all the individuals in your training population and you build a model and then you use those relationships, use the relationships between the training population and the selection candidates to predict what those selection candidates would be. Okay, so you're just taking that relationship information, but now that relationship information is calculated using the genome-wide markers rather than with pedigrees as was done in traditional best linear unbiased prediction, often used in animal breeding, not, not as often in plant breeding, but um, still used in plant breeding. So there's some equivalencies between R blup and G blup um, that I don't think I should take the time to go over but uh, it's all right here. If you make some, basically, this, this, this comes out of the properties of the multivariate normal distribution. Okay, so um, I'll just leave it at that. I'll show you that this is actually the case in the script. And then factors affecting prediction accuracy. There are some equations here from a couple of different papers that, that take some basic properties like population size, heritability, and this thing we're calling affected number of loci and using it to predict what your prediction accuracy might be under these conditions, or your expected prediction accuracy. So prediction accuracy here is, again, the correlation between the true breeding value, and in the context of genomic prediction, it's the genomic estimated breeding value, and representing that here with this R sub uh, U and the U hat, okay? And you can see what these equations are functions of. The difference between this equation here by Detweiler and this equation here recently provided by uh, Bernardo's group is that this equation actually takes into consideration the average uh, LD between um, a marker and a QTL. And you should see this reference for details on how to calculate that. Um, I should point out that in this equation, you see this effective number of loci term here. This basically represents the number of independent, let's call them independent chromosomal segments whose effects you need to estimate. And the more diverse your population is, the more of these things you're going to, you're going to have. Um, you can think about it, if you have a, a fairly narrow population where everybody is highly related, 
everybody in the population shares these big, huge chunks of chromosome, right? And it's pretty, uh, and, and LD extends for a, ver for a long, long ways. So it's pretty easy to, rep to, to estimate what the values of these big chunks of chromosomes are. But if you have a very diverse population, LD doesn't extend very far, it decays very rapidly, so you have a lot of these independent chromosomal segments you need to, to estimate. Anyway, it sort of it represents the diversity of your population, and the more diversity you have in the population, the larger this ME is going to be, and the more individuals you need to get good genomic prediction accuracy. So these are some factors that affect prediction accuracy, training population size, heritability, marker density, effective population size, um, which relates to the genetic diversity within the breeding population. Um, I should say, you know, an easy way to think about this is if you have a biparental population with a bunch of, of full sibs, uh, everybody's highly related, you only need, you need, I say, a pretty modestly sized training population to get good predictions. If you have a very diverse population, maybe the population is, you're considering is your entire breeding program, or maybe the breeding programs across the entire country, you're going to need a much, much, much larger tra training population to get uh, good predictions. Another important thing is genetic relationships between training populations and selection candidates, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then finally, statistical models, choice of statistical model. So here's an example from Barley where we have two traits uh, across the top here, Don and FHB, and we have two populations, population one and population two. You can see that when I take population one and I build a model, and I try to predict population one, I do quite well in terms of prediction accuracy. Okay? But if I take population two and try to predict population one, I do quite poorly. Okay? You can't take a population that's unrelated to the population and, and use it as a training population to predict another population that's unrelated to your training population. Okay? So relationships matter and it's something, consider, something to consider when doing genomic prediction. Another example here uh, demonstrated in this paper where prediction accuracy on an individual basis is highly related to the mean relationships of the top 10 relatives in the training population. Okay. And models, I would say, at least in the context of, of uh, plant breeding, the models are all quite similar. I say GBLUP, which is the simplest, fastest model to run, uh, does just as well as anything else. So I guess that's good news for people who actually want to implement genomic prediction in their program. Bad news for people who want to study the models. Unless they find something that's even better. And here's some, you know, there's some theoretical reasons why this is a situation. And I have those listed right here. And you can read about this in some of the references that I provided at the end of this slideshow. Um, essentially, it gets down to the uh, the extensive LD that's often present in a breeding program, okay? If you had, like say for the situation in humans, humans, the LD in humans is very, very, decays very, very rapidly, and a lot of times the individuals that form, let's say a training population in a human situation are gonna be quite unrelated to one another. So if you had a million unrelated humans and you had, uh, you know, a million SNPs, I think in that situation, some of these uh, variable selection models that are more computationally intensive would stand out against something like GBLUP. But in the context of a breeding program where LD is quite extensive, GBLUP does quite well. So here's some res resources and... Oh. You're, you're still good, but... Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> here's some resources for some common packages used for genomic prediction. There are a blood package and the BLR package. And here are some references. And I'll actually be using the RBLUP package and the BLR package in this tutorial. So I think we can just leave it at that for those.